Hi everyone, um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about Macbeth, and this is an introduction to reading Shakespeare and especially reading Macbeth. William Shakespeare was born in 1554 and he died in 1616. He was an English playwright, actor, and poet. He is often referred to as England's national poet or the Bard of Avon. His plays have been performed around the world for over 400 years. Much of what we know about Shakespeare comes from reading his plays or reviewing church records. There are no, there was no um, autobiography that he wrote or anything that he recorded about himself. Um, so really all we have are the church records and what we can glean from his plays and poems. He was born April 23rd in 1564 and is um, believed to have died April 23rd in 1616 at the age of 52. <clears throat> Excuse me. He most likely attended the King's New School in Stratford, um, where his father was a public servant, so he would have gone to school for free. He married Anne Hathaway when he was 18 and she was 26. And his daughter Susanna was born six months after he and Anne married. Um, he also had a set of twins, Judith and Hamnet, two years later. Hamnet died at the age of 11, and the daughters had children, none of which survived, so there are no direct descendants of Shakespeare. It is, um, there are some descendants of his indirectly, his sister, um, her children's children survived. So in that sense, um, but the Shakespeare name died with him. Um, in his professional life between 1585 and 1592, and again, we don't have anything written about this. It's just sort of like uh, bits and pieces have been um, put together. Um, he left Stratford-upon-Avon for London, where he began a career as a playwright and actor. No dates of his professional career are recorded, nor can the order in which his com his com he composed his plays and poems be determined with any certainty. By 1594, though, he was a he had established himself as a poet with two long works, Venus and Adonis, and The Rape of Lucrece. Um, his more than 150 sonnets are supreme expressions of the form and considered to be just beautiful. Traditionally, we say that his earlier works are the histories and the comedies. While it is difficult to determine the exact chronology of the plays, from 1590 to 1613, he wrote a total of 37 plays revolving around several main themes. They're organized into what's called the histories, the tragedies, the comedies, and the tragic comedies. His first plays were mostly histories. These plays dram dramatize the destruction of weak or corrupt rulers. Historians claim that this was his way of justifying the Tudor dynasty. Julius Caesar portrays the upheaval in Roman politics that may have resonated with viewers at a time when England's aging monarch, Queen Elizabeth I, had no legitimate heir, which created the potential for future power struggles. <clears throat> The tragic, tragedies and tragic comedies are after 1600. Again, this is just roughly um, an idea. During this period, he wrote Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, and Macbeth. In these plays, Shakespeare's characters present elements of human behavior that are universal. universal. Possibly the best known of these plays is Hamlet, which explores betrayal, retribution, incest, and moral failure. These moral fa failures often drive the twists and turns of Shakespeare's plots, destroying the hero and those he loves. Hence, they are tragedies. They do not end happily ever after. Shakespeare's theater. Theater was the main form of popular entertainment during Shakespeare's time. They didn't have TV, folks. People of all classes attended the theater, from beggars to the nobility. Shakespeare's plays were performed in many different settings, his home theater, the Globe, the indoor Blackfriars Theater, and for noble audiences, at court. 
and this is a picture of it rebuilt in London. Um, this is the inside of the Globe Theatre. Most theaters at this time, including the Globe, were round open air spaces that had seats around the stage. And I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. The most expensive seats were in the two to three levels of galleries under a roof. So that if it started raining, you know, or just protect you against the weather, the sun, the heat, um, the rain. <clears throat> a theater like the Globe could be packed with as many as 3,000 people. The audiences were loud and unruly, and it was not uncommon for audience members to shout and interact with the performers, comment loudly on the action of their fellow spectators, or even throw things at the actors on the stage. So it was a very rowdy performance. And when you think of Shakespeare, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, you think of, you know, this really high highfalutin, sophisticated kind of thing, but it really wasn't. It was really just, you know, like regular TV and regular people went to see these plays for entertainment. Um, and they would talk back to the TV, throw things at the TV if they got frustrated. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it, it really wasn't that high class kind of thing that we normally associate with Shakespeare. So let's talk about Macbeth. Shakespeare pri Shakespeare's primary source for Macbeth was a hugely popular 16th century book written by Raphael Hollinshed in 1577 and revised in 1587 called Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland. This collection of historic events and popular legends included the story of an 11th century Scottish king named Macbeth. Like many writers, Shakespeare used Hollinshed's stories as source material, but then engaged his imagination to create his own dramatic retelling. Some of the changes included, the real Duncan was a young, weak king, while Shakespeare's Duncan is an old, wise, and very popular king. The real Macbeth had the support of the Scottish chief, chieftains and Banquo when he murdered Duncan, whereas Shakespeare's Macbeth has only Lady Macbeth supporting him. And the real Macbeth was a successful king for 10 years before he was overthrown, unlike Shakespeare's Macbeth, who is overthrown and beheaded soon after taking the throne. Not a really upbeat kind of play, you might imagine. James I. During the middle of Shakespeare's career as a playwright and three years before he wrote Macbeth, James I became the King of England. Scholars have noted the following connections. Before James I inherited the throne of England, he was the King of Scotland. When James took the crown, Shakespeare's London became passionately interested in all things Scottish. Also, many Scots followed their king to London, where they often attended the theater. So you can see why this Scottish topic would then be very popular with the people in London once James I becomes king. James became a, the first became a patron of Shakespeare's theater company, and they often staged plays for him. Banquo was generally thought to be an ancestor of James I. It is believed that Shakespeare might have been paying a compliment to the new king with his flattering portrayal of Banquo. James I authored a treatise called the Silicon Doron that defends the idea that rulers are given the right to reign by God, an idea echoed in Macbeth's speeches about kingship. Witchcraft and the Supernatural The witches in the Macbeth were influenced by three strange women described in Hollinshed's chronicles as nymphs, fairies, and goddesses of destiny. Scholars believe that Shakespeare might have included witches in Macbeth because of the following. Belief in witches was common in Shakespeare's day. During Queen Elizabeth's reign, there were 247 witch trials. James I had an avid interest in witchcraft and was thought to be the, the instigator of a witch hunt during his reign in Scotland. James I wrote a book on supernatural creatures and demons called Demonology. By calling them the Weird Sisters, Shakespeare seems to have been tying them to the Weird, the goddess of fate in Anglo-Saxon literature. Fate is a significant theme in Macbeth. 
the Macbeth curse. Mention Macbeth in a theater and it will surely elicit gasps of horror from all those in the know. As the legend goes, the spells that Macbeth's witches use come from an authentic black magic ritual that Shakespeare observed. When the witches found out that he had used their sacred incantations, they put a curse on the play. Beginning with the first performance in 1606, when Hal Barrage, the boy playing Lady Macbeth, suddenly died backstage, there have been disaster stories galore about productions of Macbeth that have felt the impact of the curse. So the next time you're in a theater, make sure to call Macbeth the Scottish play. If the actual title happens to slip out, be sure to run out of the theater, spin around three times, spit, and ask to be let back in, and then just hope that the curse has been reversed. <laughs> Please don't do that. So now I wanna talk a little bit, I've given you some background information about Shakespeare, just some real basics there, and, but now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about reading Shakespeare, because this is the, the most challenging part for most students. It's not, um, it's just getting through the language. So let me talk to you a little bit about that. The Elizabethans were an audience of listeners. They would say, I'm going to hear a play, not I'm going to see a play. The Elizabethan audiences would pick up on words and their various meanings that we wouldn't. This is a quote from Marjorie Garber, who's a Shakespearean scholar. This is really important. And I know people say, oh, I don't understand what's being said. It's in a foreign language. It's not a foreign language. It's English. Um, it's an earlier form of the English language than what you're comfortable with. And it's, always, it's also written in a very distinct way, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But my suggestion to you when you're reading the play is just to push through it. If sometimes it doesn't make sense, that's okay. Just keep going because if you just push through it, you're going to be able to figure out what's going on. And the way that I've set up this unit, you've got the play and you're reading um, the first two acts and then you're watching um, the video or the movie and then you're reading the rest of the play and watching the rest of the movie. So I think if you do it that way, if you read through it first and then watch the movie, you're going to have a much clearer understanding of what's going on. Um, and it's, it's just going to make a bit more sense to you, I think. So let's talk a little bit more about his style. The structural choices that Shakespeare made help the reader and or speaker to naturally feel the tempos and rhythms of the language. Because there was very little time to rehearse in Shakespeare's day, this was a quick way for the actress to get inside the minds and hearts of his characters. Most of Macbeth is written in a very specific type of verse, which is another word for poetry, called blank verse. Blank verse is unrhymed iambic pentameter. See, we're getting close to our poetry section, which is a line of 10 syllables that has a rhythm like a heartbeat. The first syllable, slash beat is unstressed and the second is stressed. The stressed one is called the I am, I am iambic pentameter. Here's a line of unrhymed iambic pentameter from act one, scene seven of Macbeth. False, false face must hide what the false hearth doth know. Now you guys, that, that's not crazy, right? You can figure out what that means. A false face, well, that's a face that's not you're hiding what your, your false heart. So you're hiding your feelings or your emotions. You don't want other people to see it. So it really isn't as challenging as you think you, you might think it is if you just work your way through it. Well, this is the basic structure of unrhymed iambic pentameter. Shakespeare also loved to break his own rules and did so intentionally to create different emotional effects. For example, in Macbeth's famous speech from Act 5, Scene 5, he adds a syllable to the first line, giving it what is called a feminine ending, or 11 beats instead of 10. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And this is a really great, great scene in the movie. You'll really like it, I think, um, and see how, um, when you see how the actor Patrick Stewart does this. Some literary devices that you'll find. This is the other picture that I wanted to show you of um, the other side of the globe so you can see where the um, expensive seats are 
and then the cheaper seats are obviously down on the floor and the play occurs right in the middle right there um, in front of all the people face to face the majority the majority of shakespeare's plays were performed at the globe an open space stage that was lit by sunlight and had no curtains and little scenery it was up to shakespeare to use his words to paint a picture shakespeare's language rich with literary devices like similes metaphors foreshadowing and dramatic irony and imagery this is what he had to use to paint that picture he had to use language and he uses it in such beautifully funny and ironic and surprising ways that um, if you just let yourself experience it you actually might like it so some of the literary devices that he uses um, and that you you'll want to see if you can pay attention to or notice when you're reading the play he uses simile which is a comparison of two different things that often uses words like, than, or as. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. That's from Lady Macbeth. Or a metaphor is a condensed comparison that expresses a complex idea in a precise way. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. That was by Macbeth. And then foreshadowing is an indication of what is to come in the future. Fair is foul, and foul is fair, chant the witches. And dramatic irony is irony that occurs when the meaning of the situation is understood by the audience, but not by the characters in the play. For none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. We find out that Macduff was born by Caesarian. So we know, even though Macbeth doesn't, that Macduff can kill him, according to the witches. Liter uh, other literary devices are alliteration, um, and that's the repetition of the same sounds or of the same kinds of sounds, often consonants in a series of words. But now I am cabined, cribbed, confined, bound into saucy doubts and fears. So you see the cabined, cribbed, confined, that's your alliteration. And then we have personification, which gives human characters to an abstract idea or something which is not human. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? Well, hope obviously isn't drunk um, and it doesn't sleep. So, some themes that you'll see in, in this play fate versus free will, the corruption of power and unchecked ambition, appearance versus reality, and the nature of evil. So this is his coat of arms, Shakespeare's coat of arms. I have no idea what it means, but it's cool. So rather than having my question marks, I posted this um, there. There are tons and tons of resources and materials in this unit to help you work your way through it. And if you follow my directions step by step, I think you'll have some fun with it. We start off with insults, which is always fun. Well, you see a little, a couple of biographies and then the insults. Um, I always get some really funny insults, and I, I tell you that if you give me three really good ones, I will um, uh, give you extra points for it. So if you make me laugh out loud with these Shakespearean insults, um, then I'll give you extra credit. Um, take your time with this. Pace yourself. This is definitely not a Sunday night before it's due Monday kind of thing. This really is going to require you to take some time and work through. Give yourself enough time to watch the play. Um, I picked this particular version of the play because I feel like um, it's really accessible. It's got a lot of um, military, almost Nazi-like symbolism in it, and I think that it really helps to set the story. One of the interesting things about the version of the play that you're going to watch is that it uses every line from the original play. Frequently when films are made of Shakespeare's play, the um, filmmakers will edit them. This one is not one of those. This one has every line. Um, and uh, Patrick Stewart, it, he's from Star Trek, for you that are old and may have seen the reruns um, in the olden days. Uh, he is a classically trained uh, Shakespearean actor. Um, and he does such an amazing job with um, this role. 
um, the director of the play's wife plays uh, Lady Macbeth, and she is amazing. There are also some other, uh, you know, characters that you'll see throughout the play that are, you know, Banquo and Macduff, and um, that you may or may not notice from um, other uh, pieces of film. If you're if you enjoy this or if you get it a little bit and you want to watch more Shakespeare film, I really highly recommend Kenneth Branagh has done tons and tons of uh, Shakespeare plays. And one of my very favorites that he does is Othello. So um, and that's starring is it Lawrence Fishburne? I think so. And it's awesome. It's really, really good. So that's another good one to watch um, if you want to experience more uh, Shakespeare. So happy reading, enjoy the film, enjoy the play, and I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say about it soon. You guys take care.